Well, I hope that everyone is having a good week. Uh, for those of you who have been with us from the beginning, we are now in the final book of our study of the pastoral epistles, which is the book of Titus. So we've made it through 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, and we find ourselves in the book of Titus, which uh, you guys will notice as we go through it echoes a lot of the same themes of Timothy because Paul's giving very similar instruction to Titus as it relates to very similar situations of trying to establish and guide the church that is in Crete. And so, um, next slide, Mr. slide man, or next two slides. There it is. Yep. So, uh, Timothy took place in Ephesus, and Paul's giving him instruction on how to lead the church there. Titus was left in Crete, and he was given the uh, specific instruction of appointing elders in Crete and for helping to establish and manage the church there. Uh, this book was written by Paul in the mid-60s. Um, and and uh, Titus is a Greek who came to Christ, so his uh, upbringing and his background is different than Timothy, who likely had a Jewish background and a Jewish upbringing within a believing family. But what's interesting about Titus is that we, when we look at his interactions with Paul, Titus is very much Paul's like sort of spec ops operator. Like he's the guy <coughs> that when something needs to get done, he gets sent in to do it. <coughs> Guys, my, bear with me tonight. Uh, but the letter is focused on words of encouragement and strength to Titus as he's dealing with the situation there in Crete. And we're going to pick up in chapter 1, verse 1, and uh, we're going to read a little section, and then we're going to discuss it. So, Titus 1, starting in verse 1, it says, Paul, a servant of God, and I'll just pause briefly. Normally, when Paul's addressing himself, he says a servant of Christ. Here he calls himself a servant of God. There's... Uh, no particular reason why he would do one over the other, since we do believe in the divinity of Christ. Um, but it's just an interesting nod that uh, you can say servant of God or of Christ, and we are referencing the same individual there. A servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God, our Savior. What an introduction. Most of our letters, the introduction is, uh, hey, this is Jim, but this is all just his Introduction. Verse 4, he says to Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. And so, here's what I want us to look at briefly. Next slide, Mr. Slide Man. This is a quote uh, by C.H. Spurgeon. He is called the Prince of Preachers uh, because he was the preacher of the largest Baptist church in London for a long time wrote numerous books, and most, if not all, of his sermons have been published and cataloged. And the reason why we mention this term, compatibilist freedom, and this quote is in here, is because when this word elect comes up, it instinctively causes a discussion about sort of Calvinism and Arminianism and uh, how does predestination work and then, you know, if we're predestined, how does our free choice work? But what's important to note is that Scripture holds that both God is sovereign, or God is in charge, and that 
we are free and responsible for our choices. So Spurgeon in this quote says, look, I'm not going to try and resolve these issues because Scripture tries to teach them both. But what I want you all to understand is this truth that God is sovereign. He is in charge. He is in control of all of creation. And yet, Scripture says that we are responsible for our free choices, meaning that the gospel may be extended to us, but it is still our responsibility to receive the gospel. We are still responsible for the choices that we make. And that's important for us to recognize and to distinguish because Paul's concern here isn't with the elect and Calvinism, Arminianism, any of that. In fact, he blows right past this word where most of us tend to get stuck and instead keeps going. Oh, thanks, babe. Clever. She's the most important person in our family. Uh, so he moves right past this word elect and he goes on and he says, For their knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which is preached to us. And so I want you all to see the argument that is being formulated by Paul because the concern for Paul here is the things that we are responsible for, the things that we know, the things that we believe, the choices we choose to make, because they all relate to our eternity. Next slide, Mr. Slide Man. Okay? It all relates to our eternity because grace should inspire godliness. If we believe that Christ is who he said he is and has done what he said he would do. If we believe the gospel message to be true, then it should have an impact on the way we live our life. And so, if we take everything that Paul says here in these first few verses, and then we look at it in reverse, which might seem weird at first, we begin to see the flow of thought and the progression that takes place because he says that by preaching the message of Christ which is what he's talking about in verse 3 which by the way Paul uses a really fun uh, wordplay here because he says that he manifested in his word which let's go back to John 1 1 in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God but here, Paul's talking about like our actual words that we use when preaching or when sharing the gospel with someone. But it's a little wordplay here because Jesus Christ is the word that we should be preaching with our words. And so as we preach the message of Christ, both our knowledge of him as well as those we share him with, their knowledge grows. But here's the thing. There's a difference between knowledge and belief. You can have a lot of knowledge about things you don't believe to be true. But the things we truly believe to be true are the things that we act on. Right? Indeed, when we look at scripture, we're told that the demons have knowledge of Christ, but they will never put their faith in him. Never receive forgiveness. And so we need to understand that there's a difference between simply gaining knowledge and having a faith in Christ. But if we receive the message of Jesus Christ, that by putting our faith in him, our sins can be forgiven, then what we receive is hope for eternal life. Because our sins have been forgiven, which is the barrier that keeps us from a restored relationship with Jesus Christ. But this belief cannot simply stay as a belief our beliefs motivate our actions. So, an example of all of these things put together. I can know a lot about Austin, but then there's a very different thing to believe that she is wonderful and someone I should pursue for marriage, which I did believe, and then I did it. 
Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but knowledge moved into a belief. That belief then motivated and continues to motivate. I'm aware of the light bulb. I know I need to get fixed. Uh, but it continues to motivate my actions. It's not just that I was like, wow, she's marriage material. I should marry this woman. And I had that belief that motivated an action, and I proposed to her. But it's a belief that continually motivates my actions in showing affection, respect, commitment to her. Similarly, if we truly believe the gospel to be true, for Jesus Christ to be who he said he was and is, and the Bible to be true, then it continues, that belief should continue to affect our actions. Which is why he says that their knowledge of the truth accords with godliness. At the end of the day, we must preach with our words, but our lives will always speak louder than the things we say. And so our lives must reflect the truth we claim to believe. And Paul giving this instruction to Titus tells him that if these things are all in place, if one, two, and three are all put together, and it is true that we have a knowledge of who Christ is that has moved us to a place of putting our faith in him and our life is one that is trying to live in obedience to the scriptures, then we can expect to receive, next slide, next slide, man, the Christian blessings of grace and and peace, in some translations say mercy, from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Grace is an unmerited favor. Indeed, there's nothing in us that should allow us to be part of God's family. But yet, it is His grace that grants us entry into it. And it is His mercy, this continual compassion toward us, other parts of the Bible say that his face is turned toward us. And this is powerful because when someone's face is turned towards you, that means that you have their attention and they're, they're paying attention to you. They care about what is going on in your life. It's a way of saying that there's blessing. And look, I never understood this so much as until I had children. Because so I can be sitting there and they can be over to my side and they're telling me about their day. I'm like, yeah, I'm listening. But they're like, no, daddy, 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 daddy. And you're like, oh my goodness, yes. They need for you to have your face turned towards them. Doing that says to them, okay, now he's listening. Now he's engaged. Now he's paying attention. And what's amazing is that the scriptures tell us that God's face is turned toward us. Meaning he cares for us and is paying attention to us. What a tremendous blessing that is. And in addition to all of this, the end result of all of this should be peace. The Christian life should be one that is filled with peace and not meaning a lack of conflict. In fact, in just a little while, I'm going to encourage you all to have conflict. So I'm not talking about the kind of peace, as in like peace and war, where there's never any conflict, but this word peace is from the Hebrew word shalom, which means wholeness, which is also where we get the term integrity. And so if we are living our life according to scripture, our life should be one that is filled with peace because all the parts of our life are working in connection. They're all aligned. They're all whole. And our life is one that is filled with integrity. And with that, comes peace. And these are the blessings that we can expect if we are truly seeking to live our life following Christ. And so he begins in just like four verses, just this shotgun blast of amazing encouragement and, and theological truth to Timothy to remind him, hey, this is the foundation. This is the background behind every single thing we do. And 
And then he moves on in verse 5. It is this foundation that then motivates what goes on in verses 5 through 9. In verses 5 through 9, it says, This is why I left you in Crete. That's killing you yet? Okay. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers, and I open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Now, if you've been with us for a while, we've talked about elders and deacons before. We've talked about their qualifications. And so next slide, Mr. Slide Man. Here, we see this same instruction, this same list of qualifications given for leaders in the church. But here's what I want, students, you all to contemplate. How do you match up to these qualifications? Now, when we talk about managing a home well, there's things that we can discuss because obviously y'all are much younger. You're not married. You really shouldn't be drinking. But the heart of these qualifications this desire to be above reproach, to be committed to one individual for a lifetime in marriage, to, to be able to, to manage things well, humble, gentle, self-controlled, to know the scriptures, to seek after righteousness, to be disciplined. Are these characteristics that are present in your life? Are these things that you are striving for in your life? Because here is the truth. You have the capacity to be leaders in River Bluff. You don't have to be an adult to have influence. And I'm not just talking about in the kids department, and those of you who do serve over there are already aware of, of the kind of influence that you can have on those children. You can set an example to the adults of what godly living looks like. And more than just setting an example inside the church, you should be setting an example outside the church of what Christians look like. Because at the end of the day, you have influence. There are people that your life affects. Positively, negatively, your life affects them. Maybe you're aware of it, maybe you're not. But that doesn't change its reality. And the reason why all these qualifications are given for elders and for deacons within the church is because one of the responsibilities for elders in the church is to set an example for the rest of the church for what godly living looks like. So then my encouragement to you would be, let's take this same list and let's not dumb down our standards. Let's raise the bar. Let's challenge ourselves a little bit to say, how do I match up in these characteristics amongst my peers? And beyond that, amongst the people in my school for whom I set an example as a Christian. Am I setting an example of what Christian living looks like? Because your leadership is influence. And you are all influential. And 
the last one he mentions here in verse 9, he says, Be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. We've talked a lot about false teachers and truth and understanding what you believe. And like my whole thing is know what you believe and why you believe it. And you all know that. But I want to change your perspective on this idea of sound doctrine real quick. Okay? And, and here's, what I, here's what I want you to realize. When you look at this word sound in the Greek, it's related to this word meaning healthy. And so, do you have healthy doctrine? But then let's, let's take this even one step back. Our doctrine is influenced by Scripture. And Scripture is all about Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, in, in the book of John, is called the bread of life. And so then I want you students to contemplate, do you have a healthy diet of Jesus Christ in your life? And, and this is something that resonated with me real strong this week as I put this sermon together. Because since the end of August, I've been using this little app on my phone to help me be more conscious about how healthy I'm eating. Not calorie counting, because I'm really bad at that. Not caloric deficits and macros and micros and all this. Just, I'll take a picture of my food and it'll say, wow guy, no, stop eating this. Or it'll say, hey, good job. You have a, a balance of everything you should have on your plate. And my goal is to always get a, a good score. Because if I get a good score, that means that the things that I'm eating are healthy. Here's what this app really hates. It really hates uh, snacks. Really hates fast food. It really hates the things that are easy for me to just nibble on. The things that it enjoys, the things that it says are healthiest for me, are the things that my wife, because I don't cook ever, uh, are the things that my wife plans ahead of time, gets the groceries for, and takes the time to prepare. Those are the things that get a good score. And so let me ask you this, students, are you settling for, for fast food Christianity it, it, by YouTube shorts? Are you settling for little snack bars because you come to church on a Sunday or a Wednesday and you think that you're being healthy? Or are you willing to carve out the time to make a plan and to prepare time with the Lord so that you can truly have a healthy diet of Jesus Christ in your life? Because that's what will make the difference in your influence. Because you can't look like Christ to the world if you're not spending time with him. And so when it talks about sound doctrine, I want you to think to yourself, man, am I eating healthy spiritually? And challenge yourself to improve in that area. And here's why it is so important. Remember, I said at the beginning that when I talked about peace, I wasn't going to talk about a lack of conflict. We're about to get into the conflict because verse 10, right on the heels of, hey, look, it's really important to have good, healthy Christian leaders in your church. Why? You can almost imagine Titus is reading it. He's like, yes, Paul, but why? Why do I need this? Verse 10, for there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers especially those of the circumcision party. They're called Judaizers. Which, by the way, next slide, Mr. Slide Man. Oops. Next slide, Mr. Slide Man. Two slides. There it is. Okay. Ah, okay. Uh, picking up in verse 11. Sorry, the circumcision party relates to Judaizers, okay? 
Pick him up verse 11. It says, They must be silent, since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, and this is a different group of, of people, a prophet of their own said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. What a reputation. Verse 13, this testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. To the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. We're going to say verse 16. And so you see the importance of why we in the church need to have people who are good Christian leaders. Why the people in your circle of influence need you to be a good, healthy Christian. Because there are those who will stand in opposition to you. Understand, the people that are up for rebuke here are people in the church. There are people in the church that Titus is working in who are going against the gospel, either by trying to put unnecessary obligation to the Old Testament law on the people, or by living by all of their sensual impulses and desires and not living self-controlled lives. And Paul's encouragement to these people in the church, my encouragement students to you, rebuke them sharply. Why? Because you're better than them? Because they're terrible people? No. Why does Paul say to rebuke these people sharply? That they may be sound in the faith. I want you to understand something, students. Rebuke is a form of love. Rebuke is a form of love. And if we refuse to rebuke people who are living contrary to Scripture when they claim to be Christians, we are not being loving towards them. And this is hard. This goes against our natural impulse. If we've got a friend who's walking in sin and they're acting a fool and they're making mistakes, it's really uncomfortable to, to talk to them about that. It's really hard to call them out on that. And, that. and to be like, hey, you need to fix this behavior. In fact, when we try to do that, we're normally caught with the, oh, thou shalt not judge. We're told that we're not loving and accepting if we rebuke them. But I would challenge you that, it, that it's quite the opposite. Because rebuke, next slide, slide man, is designed to restore those who are not living properly. Your rebuke is one that should be done gently if possible. You should use the scriptures to point out the things that they are either believing improperly or are living improperly according to the scriptures. And do this gently because they are your friend. Because you're not trying to just browbeat them and, and prove that they're some terrible person, but your heart's desire in their rebuke should be their restoration. In fact, that's the whole purpose behind church discipline. And after we correct the error, the aim should always be then to connect them again to the body of Christ. Why? Because students, I want you to understand this. You may realize this implicitly, or you may have experienced this on your own. When we are living in sin, we seek isolation. When we're living in, in open, unrepentant, rebellious sin, 
There's something in us that seeks isolation. We don't go to the people we're supposed to go to. We don't check in with the people we're supposed to check in with. We don't seek help. That sin is trying to pull you away from the strength that is found in community. And so once this person is willing to repent of their sin, it's important that we connect them again with the body. That we forgive any mistakes and we encourage them and walk beside them as we seek to help aid them in their restoration. And so I want you all to understand the flow of thought behind this chapter for Paul. If grace inspires godliness, our godliness then is an influence. And we need to be influential for Christ. And when we fail to be influential for Christ because we have sin in our life, we need rebuke and restoration. Because that's true love. Because in that way, we care more about their relationship with the Lord. We care more about their eternal security than about their feelings. And so I want to challenge you in these three areas, student. To grow in godliness, to have a healthy diet of time with the Lord, and to be willing to gently but correctly rebuke your friends if you see them walking in sinfulness. And it's hard to do, but it's necessary. If we do this, then not only will our words, but our actions reflect Christ and bring him glory and help us to advance his kingdom. Let's pray. Holy Father, I come before you right now and I thank you for your word. And Lord, sometimes it stings. Sometimes it's challenging to read the scriptures. But Lord, I pray for these students. Lord, I pray that they would measure themselves against Scripture, not against anyone else, not against you know, their buddies or, or the culture, but Lord, I pray that they would hold themselves up against your perfect word. And that you would show them the areas where they need to change, where they need to grow, where they maybe need rebuke. And that they would grow in those areas that they would be a beautiful example of the gospel to the people that they have influence with. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen.